to thank all three speakers for um, sticking to the limited time and I, we understand the constraints and how difficult it is to run through a paper when you expected more time. But however, we are um, provided with 28 minutes of conversation, um, which is, I think the organizers wanted us to have this time where um, questions and discussions um, can flush out the larger questions and, and the conversation that was put forth. So if you have a question, please come to either Mike on left and right, introduce yourself, your affiliation, and uh, please direct your concise question to the uh, right panelists. Uh, start with you, sir. Thank you. My name is Safi Hamid. I'm with the Center for Egyptian American Relations. And uh, my question actually to Naterna. Lotania um, uh, and Rosatia, uh, do, you, do you think with the uh, very painful things which happened last uh, pilgrimage uh, in the season where 14, more than 1,400 people were killed either of negligence or poor planning during the Hajj season and we never heard a word of accountability, uh, how did these accidents uh, appear in the um, in the mainstream Saudi population and uh, the government position because all over the world I don't think any one in the Muslim world or, or the world know what happened exactly and uh, how to avoid it in the future. Thank Thanks. you. I think that, um, is this on? Yes it is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I think that that really put the um, Saudi government in a very difficult and embarrassing um, position to have such a terrible accident uh, occur in the holiest of events uh, really made them look very incompetent, uh, for lack of a better word, um, to the rest of the world. And uh, many people were looking to see you know, who was going to be held accountable and why. And it seems that the buck has just been passed and passed and passed and um, nothing really substantive that I've heard of has been done. I know that um, many Saudi citizens uh, expressed to me personally that they were embarrassed by what happened. Um, they were certainly very empathetic uh, for uh, the victims. Um, there was a desire to implement some sort of measures uh, to make sure that this sort of thing didn't happen again, but they felt very powerless to really do anything um, to make that happen. It seems that that's a government sort of decision that was out of the hands of the people. Uh, but it did result in quite a bit of rumbling uh, against the new government uh, that they were going to have to do a, a better job than this uh, in terms of providing for security. Uh, because there is still this belief that the number one job of any state is to provide its citizens and those who are visiting that country with security. And if you fail at that number one job, uh, then you really have failed as a state um, altogether. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leith Kubba from the National Endowment for Democracy. Thank you for all the presentations. My question to Cameron. Um, and I, I, I invite your, your comments and your insights into what we're seeing the inability of Muslim governments, traditional Muslim institutions, even Islamic political parties, to contain or address this abuse of Islam by the uh, ISIL, Daesh, and other extremist groups. And it's now prolonged. It's been two or three decades. And if anything, these groups are still having an appeal. And a, 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 a closer look indicates that part of the rationale and construct is actually rooted in secondary sources that Muslims have. The primary source, which is the Quran, is very clear, and I think with an open mind one can understand it. But going through historical resources and secondary resources, a lot of these movements and, and um, uh, other forms, let's say, of abuse of religion, irrespective of, of Muslim sects, um, has their roots in secondary sources. And I invite your, your like, big lens in trying to see the transformation within um, Muslim societies, how they deal with Islam. Is there a hope that um, the, the challenge of, of um, abuse of, of Islam by, by radical movements can be addressed 
without shifting the attitudes of Muslims towards their, these secondary resources? I don't know if my question is, is clear enough or I, I need to spell it out further, but I invite your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Leith. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, quickly, uh, one of the problems, and this is not just with uh, the more radical groups uh, engaged in violence or nonviolent radical groups, even mainstream groups um, are sort of fixated with medieval fiqh uh, and medieval uh, theology, and they privilege the scholars of the past, uh, and there's sort of an unwillingness to sort of really develop or at least take your gloves off and say, okay, you know what, uh, that was then, now is now, and let's go back to the primary sources and do some original thinking. There's very little of that. We see it in Tunisia with the uh, Sheikh Rashid al ghannushi uh, with the civil state and whatnot. But we don't see this even with, let's say, you know, the Ikhwan in Egypt, you know. Uh, and one of the problems, um, there's another problem, uh, which is both uh, something that society is guilty of and the state. So states by nature are undemocratic. So to expect them to, to engage in, in, in uh, a form of uh, behavior or to reform uh, is, I, I think, wishful thinking because their imperative is to stay in power. Uh, but if you look at those who want democracy, now whether they are on either side of the, sec the ideological divide, uh, they behave undemocratically. I mean, uh, whether, of course, w w I'm not justifying the CC coup, but the way in which the Brotherhood was in power for one year, uh, there were clear uh, evidence that uh, it was sort of, they, they firmly believed in a majoritarian view of democracy where you know, they thought that they had the right to the exclusion of others to engage in policy making. Now, of course, there were attempts at some points in time to bring in other people, but I think it, the, 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 it was incumbent upon the Brotherhood to do more knowing the circumstances in which they got power. Uh, so yes, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I think that it's gonna have to come from other sources. I mean, there's only so much we can expect from the states, from the, from the suspects as usual, the political, the Islamist parties. I think that uh, I am seeing in, in uh, you know, across the region and beyond, uh, you know, essentially new faces, new entities, or at least the, uh, in, in embryonic form, that who are sick and tired of the violence and, and, and sick and tired of uh, the, the usual discourse, and they're in search of, of new ways in which to deal with this, and they want to go ahead and, and, and invest time in, in, in uh, reinterpreting uh, the texts. But I think it's gonna take a long time, and I think we need to be patient. Yeah, I'm Nader Hashemi from the University of Denver, and I have a question for Maria Holt about Palestinian identity and its relationship to the uh, BDS movement, the, the, the pro-Palestine solidarity movement. And my question is, to what extent do the aspirations of the BDS um, activists, are they reflected in the interviews and the conversations that you've had with Palestinians in Lebanon, in the West Bank, from Yarmouk camp? And I ask this question because there seems to be a deep tension between what the BDS activists are proposing as a solution for the Israel-Palestine conflict and what was the traditional, at least PLO position, in terms of a two-state settlement, the importance of a flag, the importance of sort of returning to a concrete piece of land and territory that was very much um, central to Palestinian nationalism. Well, the BDS movement have rejected the two-state settlement and believe in a settlement that I suspect, but I don't know, perhaps it doesn't reflect the aspirations of the Palestinians that you've interviewed, where they are proposing now a one state, some sort of binational or unitary state with Israel, which I think, and I, I'd like to hear from you, is really perhaps more a reflection of the BDS activists' aspiration than it is in any way a reflection of perhaps what Palestinians in uh, Lebanon or in the West Bank or aspiring to. So the question very simply is, you know, are the uh, Palestinians that you've interviewed 
aware of BDS, what do they think about the BDS, is political program and, 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 and stated um, uh, solution for the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, rejecting the idea of an independent Palestinian state on the 67 borders and calling for some sort of new political integration with some future uh, Israeli um, you know, state based on some concept of binationalism. And, and just for clarification, the, the BDS stands for exactly what? And is it primarily on in Western campuses or Western? Yeah, it's basically the 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 um, boycott, divestment. the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, sanctions movement, movement, which is the mainstream sort of voice for Palestinian um, solidarity in North America and in Europe. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's actually uh, that's a really important question. Uh, I think uh, to generalize, um, I think uh, many. Many Palestinians do appreciate and support the BDS uh, movement, uh, and they, um, you know, it, it's so difficult because, you know, that they're so far from reaching a solution that, you know, people are, are, are trying these various things. I mean, there's always people I was speaking to. I mean, people in Lebanon are still, you know, many people I spoke to are still uh, kind of. Um, Ho hoping for return. I mean, they, they talk about return, so it becomes a kind of unrealistic thing. Um, I mean, there's also a sense among many. Pa yeah. Um, when I also when I interview people in Lebanon, they talk about return, but return to Palestine, not return to some uh, state in the West Bank and Gaza. They don't see that as being an acceptable solution uh, in their terms. But or, but then, realistically speaking, you know that solution has kind of disappeared. You know, it, it, facts on the ground have, have meant that the possibility of two states becomes unrealistic. You know, it, it's it, it's more and more um, impossible to imagine that. S but so where do you go from there? And I, I think you know a lot. I mean, particularly when I I speak to Palestinians in Lebanon, for example. I mean, the, the BDS isn't. It isn't such a big thing for them. I mean, I think Palestine, again, to generalize terribly, I think they appreciate you know, the effort, international efforts, w whatever they are. So that's, that's something. But I don't know. It's, 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 it's quite, um, yeah, there's quite a, a, a broad, a, a broad uh, spectrum of opinion, I, I would say. Can I just add a sort of a question mark here? Doesn't the BDS movement that's primarily based on the West and is in solidarity with the Palestinian movement will directly impact the economic lives of the Palestinians yes. and, and, and currently? And so how could they be part of a movement that's going to even further their economic situation and standing? So just as a general question. And how, how could they accommodate and negotiate this, this sort of construct if it's going to directly uh, hurt them financially. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think a, a, a lot of them would, would, would say that, would point that out. You know, again, you have to be realistic ab about these things. So, it, so on one level, yes, I mean, it's appreciated, of course. You know, it's, it's very important for Palestinians that there's some recognition by, you know, um, for international publics that, yeah. that there's some effort being taken but on the other hand realistically speaking it, it may impact but there is a lot of support actually there is a so lot of support I think particularly in the West Bank with the West Bank particularly okay. yes hello uh, my name is Kurt Bessiner I'm with the Democratization Policy Council I'm based in Sarajevo uh, I have two questions the first is to to Dr. DeLong Bass in your in your discussion of the floods that hit Jeddah and and the, and the popular reaction to them and the popular dissatisfaction with the government government not being able to respond to it, uh, as well as these twin pillars of Wasatia and Watania uh, being sort of turned around on the government uh, and being interpreted at a popular level in a way that was probably not originally intended. Uh, two parallels jumped out to me. Was the first was was the way Cyclone Nargis really hit Burma and put the government in a terrible position because it showed their callousness and incompetence in dealing with the floods. And the second was the Helsinki Final Act in terms of how the human rights provisions in that were used against the governments that signed on to them in Eastern Europe that never thought they'd be they'd be used that way. So there there are two points. So I mean, are these questions of legitimacy of the government? and representation or lack thereof, have those carried off over beyond 
uh, the, the, the Sunni and Shia joint youth activism that you mentioned uh, to, to the wider Sunni community at all. And, and, um, and this, this lack of representation, how has that sort of manifested itself in Saudi Arabia in recent years? My question to Dr. Holt is, is following on representation. Um, you would, you, um, I'm wondering how Palestinian popular dissatisfaction with the lack of, lack of, perceived lack of represent, representation both within the Palestinian Authority and in Gaza, but also in Lebanon and Syria, in those, those two, in the Yarmouk and Narabad Barad camps, uh, affects uh, their perception. I was very surprised to hear of a satisfaction when they're, they're not really integrated politically in either uh, Syria or Lebanon, or they weren't before they left. So uh, I'm just curious at your reflections on that, how that sits with your sense of, of, of them having a relatively happy life despite the fact that they, they weren't politically integrated in either country. Thank you. So in response to the question about um, uh, whether uh, there have been any efforts beyond that initial Sunni-Shia uh, joint activism, um, I think that um, there were some initial positive indicators that there were older activists who were looking at some of the relative successes of the Sunni Shia youth coalition uh, that had uh, formed and trying to learn lessons from them about what had worked and uh, what was not working. Um, unfortunately for the youth, what happened was that they were not able to agree about a national agenda. Uh, sometimes they get too distracted with, you know, are we going to deal with local issues first? Are we going to deal with regional issues? Are we going to deal with uh, national issues? And um, so there, there's still some ongoing work trying to figure out, you know, which issues do we prioritize over others? And uh, do you go for uh, the big issues that uh, it seems like you're going to get the most support for, but maybe not necessarily be realistic in terms of what the government is willing to give? Or do you focus on realistic issues first um, and see what you can actually accomplish so that you can build uh, some degree of credentials? Um, I think one of the... Uh, important stories that comes out of uh, this youth movement is the degree to which social media has been uh, a tool for enabling greater communication between groups of people who otherwise would not necessarily meet or be in contact with each other. And that's been very empowering uh, for youth in particular, realizing that gee, I'm not alone, I'm not the only person who cares about this issue, uh, but there are actually other people all over the country who are interested in the same kinds of issues that I am. And so the question is, uh, the Saudis are very good at identifying that there is a problem uh, and getting people together to work on the problem once it's identified and they will raise awareness to it, but moving it to the next stage of actually putting it into action in terms of what are we going to do about fixing it, um, I'll just say that there's still some work to do on that end. Um, in terms of uh, questions about how representation has been handled uh, in recent years, I would say that the rise of the threat of ISIS, which is a very real threat, um, not only regionally but inside the kingdom, um, and the ratcheting up of the Iran, Iranian-Saudi uh, proxy war has uh, really caused a return to a much more closed uh, society, that security has become the number one issue. And that is the issue that the state is the most focused on, uh, is providing security. Uh, and oftentimes it seems that even though Ben Franklin has warned us against this, that giving up a little bit of freedom for the sake of security is going to come back and bite you in the end. Um, right now, I think that the population in general is much more concerned about these uh, regional threats and the threat they represent inside the kingdom and the economy uh, because you have such a large youth population that is starting to flood the job market uh, that the question is, you know, where are these people going to be employed? Where are people going to find jobs? Um, and so some of the fiscal measures that we see uh, being taken under the new regime, this is not a problem that this new regime created. This is a mess that they've inherited and they realize that they're at the breaking point in terms of having to address these problems um, immediately. Um, and so the question there is, how do you gauge the balancing act? You know, to what degree can you 
push more responsibility onto the citizens, such as by cutting subsidies for water, electricity, gas, um, et cetera, versus to what degree does the state have to continue to play somewhat, at least somewhat of a role as a benefactor and providing as a welfare state. You can only push people so far because the expectation level um, has not necessarily changed. And what we're seeing is that if people are going to be expected to do more uh, and pay for more, then that's going to be accompanied by demanding more of a voice in the decision-making process. So the state's only willing uh, to go so far on that. Uh, so um, in response to um, the question about Palestinians uh, in exile, uh, I, um, I guess there are uh, two points I want to make. Uh, first of all, uh, the situation um, for Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and Syria is, is, is different. The treatment of refugees is different. Uh, so while in Lebanon they have really very few rights uh, uh, and, and uh, are not mm -hmm. able to represent themselves or, 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 you know, on so many levels, um, they're not able to, to, to do much at all. In Syria, they have had uh, more rights uh, and um, they've had rights to education and healthcare and, and various things. So it's important to remember that. So um, Palestinians in Lebanon are in a much more difficult uh, situation uh, than you know before. Obviously, in Syria now, it's 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 much worse. Um, but the other the other point is. Uh, you know the the exile, the the period of exile for Palestinians has been so long. You know, it's starting in 1948. Um, the Palestinians are kind of sick of of you know struggling, fighting all the time, and the, a natural response for human being is is to live in some sort of comfort, to live, to be happy, to have a family life. Uh, and for some of the people I interviewed. They were saying that, that they'd achieve that, you know, on, on you know, some level, uh, they'd achieve kind of a, a comfortable way of life, a good environment in which to bring up their kids, opportunities, and so on. I mean, I'm not saying it uh, replaces the, the, their desire, their right to return to Palestine, but you know, there has to be some way uh, of living in a way that's not perpetually uh, in anguish and, and in struggle. So that's what they were talking about. And some of them did say, you know, it, it replaced the homeland in some sense, because the homeland becomes a very abstract notion. Most of, most of the Palestinians living today have, have, have not seen it, have not seen Palestine. So it's just a dream, an image for them. Yeah, so of course, they're not being represented. Of course, they don't play a full part. But, you know, it's, it's kind of... Um, it's a kind of another level to, to, to think about here. Thank you. And our final question, uh, question or comment. My name is, my name is Katerina Dallacura. Um, I'm from the London School of Economics. A question for Maria Holt. Um, you, you talked about globalization providing the backdrop for um, understanding the transformation in many of the Palestinian ideas about the homeland. but. I think we see uh, a wider phenomenon here of how diaspora nationalism is changing on so many levels. So we, we sort of, we can, of course, we all know that there are diaspora nations uh, which have uh, left the homeland for a variety of reasons. And they, each of them, have adapted to the situation and have a relationship to the homeland, which is very particular to them. There is, however, a broader transformation, I think, beyond the territoriality of the nation state, and possibly the Palestinians fall into that uh, broader spectrum, even though, of course, we know the Palestinians have, uh, are a special case in some ways. My question is more, um, it's sort of unrelated. It's about the right to return and the implications of your research and your findings for the right to return if there is, and there's doubt about that, of course, a two-state solution. Um, the right to return is presented as a sort of major obstacle uh, for this two-state solution. But is it really such a big obstacle? Your findings would seem to suggest that perhaps it is not. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. Um, I think um, 
almost all the, the people I, I interviewed, I mean, people living outside um, the, the borders of Pal Palestine. Uh, I, I interviewed you know, many people living in Lebanon, uh, and uh, all of them, pretty, pretty well all of them, without question, uh, emphasized, uh, re-emphasized uh, their right to return as being a basic fundamental right. So whatever happens in the place of exile, whatever arrangements people make to live some kind of, of, of life which is tolerable, uh, the, the ultimate objective remains the right to return. Um, for many people, uh, that right, you know, many people, it, they're also realistic, so they see that um, that right isn't going to, that it's not going to come about anytime soon. It's, it's something uh, which, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So they try to make, you know, they try to think of ways to live. They try to find ways to live which, which are tolerable. Um, so, I, I, I think of any, uh, in the ongoing peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians, obviously the right of return for Palestinian refugees is one of the largest issues for you know, the so-called peace process. Uh, and the people I spoke to said that's not negotiable at all. So it's like it's an expectation we will return, one day we will return, if not, if not me, then my children, my grandchildren, we will return in, in the end. But, I mean, it seems, it doesn't seem very likely. Uh, so, um, it's, yeah. Uh, what, I, I wasn't talking about that. I was saying that um, in the right, if the right to return is granted, and it yeah. should be, mm. in fact, not many people will go back. <laughs> That's what well, I'm I, saying. That, so, in, 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 f if there is evidence to that effect, then um, then that may actually enable the negotiations to proceed, mm -hmm. as opposed to imagining that all of these people will actually want to return. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm right. not saying that, of, co of course, the right to return is, mm -hmm. ha has to be respected, mm -hmm. but in practice, mm -hmm. uh, will it be such a, such a huge issue? No, and, I, you're, yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, you're, you're, you're right, um, and um, it, well, the, the formal position is, of course, the right to return. In reality, you're absolutely right. Many people um, have got settled lives in the places where they live. Um, they've got their families. All sorts of things have happened to them, and so and, you know, people privately would say that they say, I, I absolutely, fundamentally believe in the right to return. I myself um, wouldn't wish to do it. You know, I, I have, I have a life here now. So you're right. So, in reality, I, you know, I have no idea. It's it's very hard to say. People often say that you know, it, obviously, the worst, uh, the most, uh, um, you know, the, the most suffering community are the Palestinians in in Lebanon. I mean, they're by far in the worst position. So, if there was some sense of, you know, people being able, being allowed somehow that some, a group, some refugees would actually be able to return. It should be those people because they're, uh, they're in by far the worst position. And if you think about it, I mean, there's such a small number. I mean, re re uh, registered refugees in Lebanon are some, something a little over 400,000. So it's tiny, even if all of them wanted to return, which they don't. So you, you, you know, it may be that there isn't a huge obstacle at all in, in, in terms of actual physical uh, return. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have to stop here at the moment. I'm sorry, and I'll pass it to Wadwan. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the speakers and the panelists and the moderator of this session and the previous session also for the wonderful uh, presentation. Please give them a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting so far, and we hope the afternoon sessions will be equally uh, informative. Uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, we are videotaping the whole conference, and it will be available on, online on our website, and that we also are doing live streaming, so we have people who are watching uh, us, uh, not only in this room, but uh, hopefully throughout the world. Uh, we have an email list of uh, 50,000 people uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, that are in touch on, uh, you know, uh, on email and website and all that. So, uh, you know, this audience is not just uh, uh, people in this room, but hopefully we have people all over the world who are watching us now or maybe watching it uh, later. 
Now we are going to uh, adjourn to the luncheon, to the other room across the hall, and uh, we, have, we have our keynote uh, speakers and our keynote luncheon. Uh, so please try to move as quickly as possible so we try to catch up a little bit with, uh, with regard to time. Thank you.